Well, we're gonna, we had taken, uh, originally planned five weeks for, three weeks for Kingdom and two weeks for Israel. We're now on our fifth week of Kingdom, which we will indeed finish up today. Um, uh, as a, a quick review, we're going through distinctives uh, of IRBC. These are the things that make our church uh, doctrine perhaps a little different from uh, other churches. And think that it's a you know, it's a wise thing to go through and at least uh, define ourselves for those who are attending. Um, Joel had taken a week, uh, his one assigned week, and he did it in one week uh, on the uh, taking a quick look through our uh, our doctoral statement uh, that might be distinctive. And uh, we are spending these weeks on kingdom, which is is very important, and we'll discuss a little bit more yet uh, today. Uh, also, uh, we, we have doctrine that may be uh, different from a lot of evangelical congregations on Israel, and we'll be addressing that again beginning this week and going into the next week, and possibly the week after that. Um, the, uh, we've been through, we're using, uh, we're using a statement from uh, the International Church Council Project, who are uh, putting together a creedal statement, hopefully to be published in 2017. Uh, we are using their chapter number four, or topic number four, dealing with the kingdom of God. I did, uh, if anybody doesn't have uh, a statement on the kingdom of God, I did uh, get a couple of copies. If you want to raise, raise hands, we'll get that out. Um, and we're, we're using the, uh, their statement, we couldn't find anything to really disagree with here, so why, why reinvent the wheel? The kingdom of God is, uh, it certainly has transformed my thinking um, about my Christian walk, and it's, it's no small topic. We are, we are through uh, to the last two articles. <coughs> Uh, in here, and we'll, we'll go through those, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion and conclusion on the kingdom. So we will go with, I was corrected last week, my Roman numerology was a little bit off. So for anyone who was offended by, by not reading the, the Roman numerals properly, I my apologies. XXIV, which I believe is 24. Okay, I see nods. <laughs> Uh, Article 24, the kingdom transcends national entities. Uh, and, and this, one of the things that we love about this, uh, for anyone who's, who's new here this week, uh, is the affirmation denial format gives you no place to hide, or little fewer places to hide than a simple affirmation or statement. Uh, and so we really enjoy that format. Article 24, we affirm that the kingdom of God transcends all national, political, and ethnic boundaries, uniting all believers in its king, Jesus Christ. We deny that the kingdom of God can be identified or equated with any geographical, national, political, or ethnic entity. Uh, I don't think that any of us would uh, argue with the denial. I think that the proof text uh, that they give here, the first one, Luke 13, 27 and 30, uh, which I'll read, <coughs> pretty well nails this. Uh, Luke 13, 27. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are the last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. And we're saying, we're seeing east, west, north, south. We see that all national entities uh, are subject to King Jesus. <clears throat> and I don't know that there's any particular argument about this this article. If there are any questions about this, please raise them and we'll hit them. Okay. <coughs> the last article in here 
uh, is entitled Historic Orthodoxy Supports These Affirmations. Uh, and I believe that that's true. We affirm, A, that the Kingdom of God is a central teaching of the New Testament and cannot be neglected without loss to the Church and the Church's influence upon society. B, that millennial issues flow from the understanding of the Kingdom of God rather than vice versa. C, that it is more important strategically for the Church to engage in building the Kingdom of God on Earth than for it to resolve its disagreements about the millennium. D, that the foregoing affirmations and denials are consistent with the mainstream of historic Orthodox Christianity. We deny, A, that Orthodox Christianity has ever adopted a universally accepted position regarding eschatology or regarding the fulfillment of the Kingdom of God. And B, we deny that Christians should make such views as premillennialism, amillennialism, or postmillennialism a test of orthodoxy. And it's interesting that they say there are no scripture references for this, since it concerns the historical period subsequent to the writing of scriptures. But it's a great launching point for our conclusion on, on the kingdom. Um, the kingdom of God is indeed a central teaching in the New Testament, but it's also a central teaching in the Old Testament. That we see kingdom, uh, the kingdom is referred to all through scripture, and if you do a word search on any of your computer uh, concordances, it will keep you busy for quite a while reading about the kingdom. Um, and the important thing is that it is central in the New Testament. It's not this individualistic, pietistic, oh, we're, we're all saved, and now I got mine, and I can live my life as I wish kind of thing. It cannot be neglected without loss to the church and the church's influence on society. We talk today about being whole. We talk today about doing. Um, and our doing is, is our proclaiming. Our proclaiming the, the truth of our foundations, the truth of our, of our gods and our Savior uh, to people who will deny it. Um, and by embracing the kingdom, we, we transform our view of Christianity from uh, murkiness to a clearness because it, it gives us a purpose. It gives us the framework in which we operate as Christians. We're operating as subjects in the kingdom. We're operating as soldiers in Christ's army. And by understanding that Christ desires a kingdom here and now, and not just to come, and not just in the by and by, but now, it gives us the clarity we need in order to be bold. It gives us the, the as I said, it gives us that framework in which we can operate. Now, we're not to necessarily go to war uh, in, in, by, in physical means. We are at war in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm. And by proclaiming God's word, we will transform our culture and our world as people have to confront the truth. Um, it transforms our Christianity, I think, in, in, from inactivity to activity. We've talked about uh, this idea of, I got mine, and I'm just going to sit back. But you can't do that when you have a kingdom mentality. You will confront when you see things that are wrong, when you see untruth being put forth in life, when you see injustice, biblical injustice taking place, you'll face it, you'll talk about it, you'll confront it, and you'll confront people with it. Um, the, uh, the, the kingdom, as I said, because it gives us a framework, uh, it, it gives us a roadmap. It, I, I was an avid uh, Charlie Brown fan when I was younger, uh, guy and I've got a stack of, of comic books of his. One of my favorites in there was Charlie Brown saying, "If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there." 
And, and a lot of Christians operate that way. Okay, I'm saved. Cool. And then they just go about their lives. But when you get to, uh, when you grab a hold of this kingdom idea, that we are to promote and advance God's kingdom, it gives you that roadmap. Um, the other thing that, that uh, in this study I felt was uh, just outstanding was this idea of, uh, it, it was a way of resolving that, that constant works problem that we run into. Uh, in the article, it was uh, Article 11 in here, um, where we we affirm that uh, because King demands obedience from his subjects and children, repentance is necessary for citizenship in the kingdom, and genuine repentance is evidenced by deliberate and continuing choice to submit obediently to the Lordship of Christ. Uh, and the denial that anybody can rightly claim Christ uh, as Savior who does not submit to him as Lord, um, it, these things are, are, are they're just so important. That Christ will, they deny that Christ will save anybody who refuses to submit in grateful obedience to him as Lord. And they deny that the view embraces the idea of salvation by works. It's not salvation by works. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ. But if you're saved, you'll give evidence. You'll submit. You'll you'll you'll, you'll show it. There's a Rush Dooney in his uh, systematic theology uh, has a paragraph in here that I'd like to read. It's, it's along the same lines. Faith means saying amen to and relying totally on the triune God with all our heart, mind, and being and acting on and in terms of the reality of God and his law word in every area of our lives. If faith is reduced to and believing on Christ becomes a mere assent to knowledge or to reality, then antinomianism <coughs> against the law uh, becomes a logical necessity. There is then no inescapable link between faith and works. You have to submit and you put your works linked to your faith. On the contrary, to say then that we are saved by faith logically means that we're saved without any necessity for works ensuing. The doctrine of the carnal Christian who is saved but still totally godless in his life is a logical consequence of such a faith-only doctrine. So he's just he's hammering that same idea of submission to the lordship of, of Christ as being uh, as being vital because. He's the king. That's why we submit. We're subjects. Um, so, I, as I said, I think it's a, it's an, a transforming idea of really concentrating on this idea of kingdom. Uh, I know that the studying it for me has has deepened that, um, and certainly I was uh, as caught up as anybody in. Pre-millennialism, millennialism, post-millennial, um, this eschatology, um, and and yet uh, I think even bef well well before we started to to work on these distinctives, this kingdom idea has been central. It, it really started. I started to see that the, our eschatology must flow from our view of the kingdom. It's more important to know that Christ is king and Christ rules all than it is to know or think we know when he's coming back, how he's coming back, all those kinds of things. Uh, and and they, it's, it's, I'm very grateful that the, uh, the statement here talks about the millennial issues flowing from our understanding of the kingdom. I think that's, that, that was an important point as well. So that's my conclusion. I want to open it up for discussion here before we get into our uh, discussion of the church in Israel. Uh, are there any questions about the kingdom? Are there comments about the kingdom? Uh, this idea that, that anybody would like to clarify or comment on? That's right. Um, so I think 
especially Article 25, and the very end, very noble. I completely affirm that. I'm glad we affirm that. Maybe this isn't the right setting to ask this question, but so what we're saying as a fellowship is, look, if your gospel is the truth, and your focus is further in the kingdom of God now, we believe we can work with it. So what do we do when we run into other two gospel is the same and we do believe in the advance of the kingdom, but would make us apology a dividing point and want to insist on dialogue about that before this cooperation. Do we and again maybe this isn't a good place to go. Well, I don't know. I, I think that you can have honest discussions and honest disagreements with with folks about their their views on eschatology if indeed we are trying to advance the kingdom. If we're trying to restore the crown rights of King Jesus, I can work arm in arm uh, with them. I, I, I think I've told the story about uh, an associate pastor at, at a former church. Uh, I was at that point a millennial, and he was still avidly pre-millennial. And, and I poked him one day, and, and I said, uh, you know, I have all eternity to say I told you so. And he said, as long as you don't mind me pointing to you and poking you in the ribs on the way up during the rapture, <laughs> that the premillennial rapture, you know, he was just saying, yeah, we'll, we'll find out when we get there. But we worked side by side, and then that was fine, because we agreed on the essential things. Um, if, if people are so divisive that they, that they won't, that they don't agree with this being a test of orthodoxy, well then, I'm not sure that they're going to want to work with us. We can be willing to work with them, and we can extend the right hand of fellowship. But if, if that's so important to them, then that's their problem, and they'll divide from us. Um, but I think we should have the, the discussion. I think it, uh, as we've gone through here, the, there are several of the articles that deny that we have to worry about the constant or the, the, the kingdom advancing and all this work taking place before Christ gets back. So the authors here would appear to be uh, post millennial in their outlook, which I think flows from again the view of the kingdom. I, I don't know how you would reconcile a millennial and pre millennial views with the the kingdom advancing here and now. With Christ, if you affirm that Christ is king now, and that all nations today, now, owe allegiance, I'm not sure that you can square that with post our pre millennials. But perhaps they can. It's, that would be the discussion. Um, yeah, did I address it? Yeah, I think so. Anybody else? Okay, so now we step into um, Israel and the church, which is, uh, this can also be quite contentious. Um, what kind of Again, a statement from the uh, Church Council Project, which I would encourage anybody to go visit their website. It's Church Council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, churchcouncil.org. And at the top of their website, there's a, uh, a link that says official documents. And you'll see all 20, uh, I think they have 25 different uh, uh, topics. Um, before we start on Israel and the church, I thought what I would do is, and this is this can be a lengthy reading. I would like to read Romans 9, 10, and 11. We often uh, we often address bits and pieces of of these uh, chapters, but it it's unusual for us to uh, to hear it all in one reading. It's a, because they're so lengthy, and we're, we're normally expositing on several verses, but it's, it is the definitive uh, 
statement in the Bible about Israel and, and um, how we're to, to deal with the, the idea of the topic of Israel. So, Romans, beginning, actually I'm going to begin at um, chapter 8, verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that, that I myself were cursed separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. But it is, it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Neither are they all children because they're Abram's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills, nor the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to, the, to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raise you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why, why does he still find fault? For who is this his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? For it is not the potter have a right over the clay, to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use, and another for common use. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath, and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his work on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, Unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation, for I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into, to, into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not heard? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have not heard. Have they? But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone, gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. I say that God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah how he pleaded with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to bow. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious, gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you were arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. 
to those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted back into their own tree? For I do not want you, brethren, to be unformed of this mystery, so that you will be not wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the Gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut off all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? Or for who has first given to him that he might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. A, um, a very convicting several chapters of, uh, of Scripture where Paul lays out his view and his explanation of the mystery. I do not want you to be uninformed of this mystery, he says. The mystery of why Israel was hardened for our sakes and the glory that will come again to the world in greater measure when Israel is grafted back in. For a little bit, a uh, little bit more context before we go to discussing the uh, the articles in here, I want to read from a book. This is a uh, this has really uh, been a terrific book for me. The Puritan Hope by Ian Murray. I highly recommend it. Gives an idea of uh, the subtitle here is revival and the interpretation of prophecy, where Murray talks about uh, the Puritans' hope in a revival and in regular revivals throughout history that occur at God's timing and at God's pleasure, um, and how they read, especially how they read these prophecies about Israel and that as Israel gets grafted back in it will be greater and greater blessings uh, to the world um, I want to read just two paragraphs uh, from a chapter in here that kind of set the context <clears throat> there are several reasons why the future of the Jews was a subject of importance in the minds of so many Christians in the 17th century. That was the height of Puritanism. For one thing, they considered that a concern for the welfare of that scattered nation is a necessary part of Christian piety. Of the Jews concerning the flesh, Christ came. To them first was the gospel preached, and from them was it received by the Gentiles. Which should teach us, writes Edward Elton, not to hate the Jews as many do, only because they are Jews, which name is among so many odious that they think they cannot call a man worse than to call him a Jew. But, beloved, this ought not to be so, for we are bound to love and honor the Jews as being the ancient people of God, to wish them well and to be earnest in prayer to God for their conversion. We shall later note how this awareness of duty toward the Jews did enter into the day-to-day -day living of many Christians in the 17th century, and yet their interest in Israel was always set in a wider context than the particular future of the nation. 
It was it, Israel's future within the kingdom of Christ and the relation between their incoming and the advancement of Christ's glory that was uppermost in their thinking. The future of the Jews had decisive significance for them because they believed that the little is clearly revealed of the future purposes of God of history. Enough has been given us in Scripture to warrant the expectation that with the calling of the Jews, there will come far-reaching blessing for the world. Puritan England and covenanting Scotland do much of the spiritual blessing, and it was the prayerful longing for wider blessing, not a mere interest in unfulfilled prophecy, which led them to give such a place to Israel. The Puritans were looking for Israel to come to Christ because of these verses that we read, that, uh, that said if their disobedience has been a blessing to the Gentiles, how much more will their ingrafting be to us? But resurrection, life from the dead, it'll be as if we've already gone through the resurrection. Things will get so much better when the Jews come in. So there's a broad context, um, and uh, I wanted to have the Romans chapters uh, in your mind as we begin to review uh, Israel and the church. So, a few weeks ago when we were going through uh, the kingdom, we talked about the, uh, the passage in Hebrews 12, uh, I believe it's chapter 12.22, where the writer of Hebrews equates to Zion with the church, and we'll want to keep those things in mind as we read through our uh, proof texts um, on uh, Israel and the church. There are, there's a movement, uh, philosophy, uh, theology perhaps, uh, that they, they call it replacement theology. That the, and they, they say it with derision, that the church replaced Israel. And they don't like it. They, they, they uh, I remember Beth, you were uh, you were talking about it in the foyer of, of church, and and you were talking about the kingdom, and you were talking about the church inheriting Israel's blessings, and the uh, the fellow said, uh, uh, "Be careful, you're you're wandering into replacement uh, theology," and he was he was chastising you for thinking so. And yet, the church and Israel are, the church, I think, clearly is put forth as the true Israel. They are not all Israel who are born of Israel. So, anyway, um, let's start with <coughs> Article 1. We affirm that by virtue of divine election, the preservation and ultimate engrafting of Jewish people demonstrate God's mercy and faithfulness to his word, and serves the purpose of the conversion of the Gentiles, just as the engrafting of the Gentiles serves the purpose of the conversion of the Jews. We deny that this divine election implies the salvation of individual Jews without their repentance and conversion through the gospel. And the proof texts there are Romans 11, 1 and 2, and 25 to 26, where Paul talks about the rejection of his, of his people, but, again, talks about their partial burden. There's a remnant that remains. So there are Jews to this day who can be converted, who are converted, who come to Christ. Uh, but they are the remnant of the Jewish people that, uh, that Paul's talking about in, in, his, uh, in his scripture. Um, we had a... a Mars presentation on Israel some uh, months ago, uh, where we talked about the the racial distinctives uh, in in Paul's day when he was uh, writing that he was a descendant of of Abraham and a Benjamite Benjaminite. Um, he could trace his records, his genealogy. Uh, those records have all been lost, and. As was pointed out in the uh, in the Mars lecture, uh, most of 
the people that we call Jews today are actually from um, Eastern Europe, Western Russia region of the Caucasus. Uh, called the, it's a tribe that was called the Ashkenazim. Um, they may not even be, I think that they're not Semitic. And so we, we talk about anti-Semitism. Well, these people aren't even Semites. They are, uh, they are a tribe that was largely Judaized in the beginning in the middle, uh, middle Ages, who became devout Jewish believers and converts. Uh, and when it came time to uh, resettle Palestine, we, we have most of these uh, people are, are, who are coming into uh, the nation of Israel. So, on a, on a racial basis, uh, the, the Jewish nation uh, doesn't exist in the same sense that the Jewish nation existed in Paul's time. And even in Paul's time, we must note that anyone who wished, any foreigner who came to Israel uh, and would swear allegiance to Yahweh and be circumcised could become Jewish. So, when, even when Abraham was made a nation, he was circumcised and all his household with him, all his slaves, who were not obviously descendants of Abraham, were at that time also uh, circumcised and became part of the nation uh, of Israel. So we have this idea of who are the Jews. We have a really no idea who the Jews are, except people who call themselves Jewish. On a racial basis, we don't have any any true idea. It may be ge that genetics will find this out. I've seen some evidence to say that they can kind of trace these things out, but because the records were lost, the in interbreeding um, between uh, the original racial Jews and others now is probably beyond putting the, the gene back in the bottle. I don't think you put Humpty Dumpty back together here. Um, but, with that being said, there, the divine election here of the Jews, uh, we deny that it implies the salvation of Jews without their repentance and conversion. So salvation today is the same as salvation has always been, and it's belief that God will provide the Redeemer, like he did on Mount Moriah with, with Isaac. God will provide himself the Lamb. So, um, I'm rambling. So I'll stop and I'll, I'll ask for, for questions, comments, or complaints. Okay. Article 2. I have a question. Um, if we really don't know who the actual Jews are, does that mean we just go to, like, we're supposed to love the Jews? If, if they're not Jews racially, does that mean they're just five Jews uh, spiritually? I think spiritually. Yeah. I, people who declare themselves <coughs> Jews are Jews. If they're going through the ritualistic aspects of uh, the circumcision, if they are attempting to obey the rabbinic tradition <coughs> today, um, and the law, uh, I think that you would argue from Scripture that a Jew was one who uh, was circumcised and attempted to obey the, God's law. Most Jews today would uh, deny the Torah and instead embrace the rabbinic teaching as opposed to the to the actual law of God. Um, I, uh, as I was preparing for uh, the Sunday school class on the Westminster uh, Confession. Joe Warcraft, I was listening to Joe Warcraft uh, audios, and he, he gave an example of speaking at a, at a I think it was a, a ACLU conference where the, he was the token uh, radical right-wing fundamentalist Christian. Um, and also on the podium was a, a Jewish rabbi. And the Jewish rabbi was talking about the Old Testament laws 
and Joe Warcraft stood up and said something about the, well, it seems that we have something in common in that we both embrace God's law as our starting point for uh, for uh, in our teaching, in our, in our religion. And he said that this little Jewish rabbi straightened himself up and said, oh, you mis you're mistaken if you think that our religion is based on the law, it's based on the rabbis. And he really took them to task. And that's, so it, it's kind of hard to figure out, in my mind, it's hard to figure out who's a Jew. A true Jew from the standpoint of the Bible, as opposed to those who are just identifying themselves as, uh, as Jews. Is, are, are there any true Jews? I think that if you're a true Jew, in the sense that you believe in the Old Testament, if you've been, if you truly believe the Old Testament, Christ said you believe in me. If you, Moses spoke of me. So in the sense, then that sense, the church has succeeded Israel. They're not all Israel who who are born of the flesh of Israel. So I think that we have to say that there's that God has kept his hand on what we're calling the Jews in that they're still um, they still survive as a, as a tribe, as a people, as an ethnic group they've not been stamped out of history which is we can't quite deny that um, I don't think that there's much to worry about or, or much to think about from the standpoint of the national identity there is that ethnic identity that we have to, to try to grapple with and I believe that we have to accept a person as Jewish who claims that he's Jewish. I don't know what you can do about bloodlines. I don't know how Hitler was trying to play that game. Because even at that point, the bloodlines were, were gone. Um, so I, I don't know if I quite answered your question. I think that we just have to accept that if they're calling themselves Jews. If, especially even if they're observant, quote unquote, observing whatever that might be, um, that we have to accept them as, as the Jewish people. So. I don't know if you're going to get into this at all or not, but um, you just briefly talked about the idea of the place of Calvary. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting going up, I like grew up in a paper dissertation setting. You know, that was something that I really had to wrestle with when I came to the scriptures as far as. I had always been taught that, you know, replacement theology meant that you believe all the promises of Abraham, you know, were not going to be given to the church. And, and as I studied through scripture and actually began to realize that in the immediate promises made to Abraham are actually fulfilled to Abraham. I don't know if you're going to get into that at all or not, but I, I think it's important to make that distinction because in most evangelical circles, when you say replacement theology, a lot of people believe you are ascribing to the church the immediate promises to Abraham. And I think there should be a distinction made there because I would actually argue that, that the place of theology in the biblical sense is not at all calling for that God is not calling for the spiritual blessings of Israel. Yeah, and, that, that makes, I, I, and I agree with that. And we are, well, we're certainly not going to get to it today. But um, yeah, I think we, that we will do. Uh, something on that, even if it's not addressed specifically in these uh, in these statements. So, because it, it's an important thing, because we will run into it over and over and over. So, yeah. It is quarter of. I don't know if we can smell pizza yet, but um, I think we'll close for today, and we will get into this in some more depth uh, next week. So let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we, we thank you again. Thank you. We're so grateful that you have called us out, that you have plucked us as burning brands from the fire uh, to which we were destined. And yet, you have made some vessels for honor. And we, uh, we're, we're grateful for it, though we don't deserve it. That's why we're so grateful. There's nothing in us save your calling that makes us at all lovely. And we, uh, we thank you that you look at us as though we are wearing Christ's righteousness.
And we thank you for this in Christ's name.